firstly, thank you to the GA and to Martin Kennedy for the invitation to present today. I think it's a real privilege to be able to come and talk to coaches like you guys who are really engaged in their learning, who are eager to learn more. And I know that I've learned a lot already today from just conversations with my peers and from watching some of the sessions that have gone on. What I'd really like to focus on today is the importance of youth coaching as the key component of supporting young people in sport. What I'd really like to look at is how we provide a quality experience for young people. Over the last couple of years, I've worked with Leinster GA in the development of their Thuris program. And if you're Leif of the Gaelge, you'd know that Thuris means journey. And I think that's a really great way to conceptualize our coaching. Because after all, we're all on a journey to get better, we're all on a journey to learn, and we're all on a journey to support young people. And the tagline of the Thuris program is better coaches make better players. And I think that firmly puts us as youth coaches at the center of providing a really quality experience for the young people with which we interact. So like Ronya started, a little bit of uh, background about who I am and why I'm interested in this area. As Gronje said, my first training was as a PE teacher and as a coach. And then after a few years teaching, I went back to university to study for a doctorate in talent development and sports psychology. Because what I've always been interested in is helping people get better, understanding how people learn, and supporting people to reach their potential. I now work in Dublin City University where I teach and I research, mostly in talent development and coaching. And I really uh, work as well with national governing bodies, clubs, because I want to see the implementation of those ideas on the grass to impact those kids that are kicking a ball over on the other side of this dome. So sport has always been a really important part of my life as a coach, as an educator, as a player. But then six years and eight years ago, two long-term sporting projects came into my life. And I started to see sport through another lens. And I started to see the impact that sport can have on the lives of young people. And how the experience that they get when they cross that white line on a Saturday morning can both turn them on and turn them off sport for life. We're fairly sport agnostic in our house. Schieffer and Irla play everything. They play hurling, football, rugby, hockey, golf, swimming, and everything in between. And that's a purposeful decision on our behalf. We want them to have a broad range of activities across a diverse range of sports. But most importantly, we want them to interact with different coaches in different contexts that use different methods, principles, and philosophies. We want them to have a varied diet of sport. Like I'd imagine most people in the room, I now spend all my weekends coaching young people and children in sport. And even though I've always known that sport is really important and it's been a part of my life, oh my goodness, coaching young people in sport is challenging, it's complex, and it's demanding. As a case in point, that's my six-year-old in the corner giving me some pretty cutting feedback about my football session. But coaching young people is so rewarding because we get to see firsthand those people learning, enjoying sport, and developing. And I think that, after all, is the reason why we're all here. We want to give young people a positive experience. In fact, I'd argue that coaching young people in sport is, re is a really privileged place to be. Because, after all, there's very few other experiences where we get to influence so many young people. But with that privilege comes great responsibility. And the challenge that I'd like to set all of us who work with young people is how can we strive to be the best youth coach we can be? How can we strive to learn? How can we strive to develop? And how can we strive to be an expert youth coach? With that in mind, I'd like to set everyone a challenge. With whatever group of players or whatever team you're working with at the moment, fast forward 10 years. You're walking down the street in your town and you bump into some of those players in 2032. What would you like them to remember about your coaching? What would you like them to remember about you as a coach? What would you like them to remember about the influence that you had on them? So that's a question that I ask myself all the time. What would I like my players to remember and think about their experience of me as a coach? And when I think about that, what I'd really like them to remember and what I'd really like them to believe is that I helped them learn, that I helped them get better, that I helped them improve. Of course, some of the kids in those photographs, they might well go on to play for Leash. They might even go on to play for Ireland. Most of them might go on and play for a team in their club. But as a youth coach, what I really want to do is I want to build the foundations so all of them stay involved in sport at some level relative to their motivation, relative to their ability. 
For some, that might be an elite level. Others might end up playing Gaelic for mothers. Some of them might tog out for their junior B team with their buddies on a Friday night. But if we do the right thing early as, a, as youth coaches, we're setting everyone up for possibility. We're setting everyone up to have choice and challenge around sport. And we're helping people learn, develop, and fulfill their potential. This is one of my favorite quotations from Kipling. And it says, no printed word nor spoken plea can teach young minds what they should be. Not all the books upon the shelf, but what the teachers are themselves. And I think that firmly puts the emphasis on us as coaches, as youth coaches, as providing an optimal experience to young players. And it gives us a responsibility to make sure that the coaching that we give them on a Saturday morning or a Tuesday night is a really positive experience that helps them learn, that helps them develop. So I'm from Limerick, and I was really fortunate that one of my first jobs in talent development was supporting Limerick GA with the development of their academy system. And as part of that job, I supported Shane Fitzgibbon, who's in this photograph here, and I provided kind of sports psychology and coaching support to a range of underage teams from under 14 right up to minor level. And then when Limerick got to the All-Ireland in 2019, I happened to bump out into Shane outside Crow Park. And we hadn't seen each other for a few years. And we were just catching up, saying, God, wasn't it great that a good bunch of those players that we had when they were 14, 15, 16 were on the cusp of winning a senior All-Ireland? And my partner kind of turned around to us and went, do you know, isn't it a shame? No one here really acknowledges the work that you guys did with those players when they were 14, 15, or 16. You guys aren't getting any of the credit for this win that Limerick are about to have. And I think to Shane's credit, he turned around to Damien and went, God, that's not what it's about. That's not why we're youth coaches. Those guys walking up the steps of the Hogan stand and lifting the Liam McCarthy Cup today, that's what it's about. That's why we do what we do. And I think that is such a huge lesson for youth coaching. All of us involved in coaching young people, we have to have a long-term agenda. We have to think about why we're doing what we're doing. We have to think about delayed gratification. As a coach, you mightn't get the rewards of your coaching straight away. You might ask, the rewards of your coaching might take years to come to fruition, and you might even be in the picture when that happens. My lesson from this story is us as, as youth coaches, we have to be an egoless coach. We have to do it to develop those players as they progress. And this brings us to this idea that coaching is a decision-making process. And I, I'd imagine that lots of people in this room have been on coaching courses where the emphasis has firmly been on what you coach, on drills, on skills, on games. And we take that education and we try and put it into practice on a, on a Saturday morning or a Tuesday night. And of course, those ingredients of coaching are important. But my challenge is that knowing what to coach isn't as important as knowing how you coach and why you coach. And I'd like to think of this as the difference between being a cook and being a chef. If I'm a cook, I'm going to follow a recipe. I'm going to get all the ingredients, I'm going to cut it up in the right order, and I'm going to faithfully follow that recipe as, as, as much as possible. If I do that, I keep the oven at the right temperature, I stir it, and I put in the right um, spices at the right time, I might produce a good meal. In coaching terms, if I take a coaching card and follow this session that Mick Mahan did this morning, I might have a decent coaching session. But if one thing goes wrong, if one of those ingredients is missing, something burns, the temperature isn't right. If I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing, I can't tweak my coaching, can I? I don't have a rich body of knowledge to go, oh, now I need to change this and I need to do that. In a chef analogy, I just kind of have to put it in the bin and start again. The difference with a, co with a chef is a chef might start with that same box of ingredients, but they know a lot more about cooking. They know a lot more about food. So they can tweak the, the meal to meet the needs of the person that's eating it. And I think that's a lot like good coaching. If I'm a chef, I have a rich body of knowledge. If I'm a chef as a coach, I might have skills and drills I'm going to use, but I'm going to tweak it to the particular needs of the players in front of me. I might make it a bit easier for someone, I might make it a bit difficult for someone else. 
I'm going to taste test my coaching as I'm doing it. I'm much more concerned about principles rather than methods. I'm much more concerned about why I'm coaching rather than the what of, of, of coaching. And I think that's really important because when we're coaching young people, we're going to be faced with a whole range of different challenges compared to coaching children or adults. So if I'm coaching young people, I think really what I'm doing is helping define their future potential. I'm do putting stuff in place now that is going to give them a chance to be something later on. And if that's the case, then the decisions I make as a youth coach can't be the same as the decisions I'd make as an adult coach. If that's the case, youth coaching cannot be seen as a watering down of adult coaching. It has to be something different. So research experiments come in all shapes and sizes. And twin studies are a really good way to understand a social phenomenon like sport participation. So that's me and my twin brother Owen in the top corner of the picture in our family home back in Limerick. And as a twin, me and Owen had the same parents. We had more or less the same genes. We had lots of the same experiences and opportunities. But at least in a sports participation outcome, God, we had very different results. Sport has always been a really important part of my life. I still, I still play sport and I, ha I always have. Owen played sport when he was a kid, but once he got to 11 or 12, he never again took part in sport. In fact, he wasn't even particularly physically active. I think the technical term is he wouldn't have run to warm himself as a teenager. So what is the difference? Why did one of us continue participating and, and the other didn't? And I think there's four main reasons that underpin engagement in sport. Without actual competence, being able to do something, well-developed fundamental skills, like Mick was doing earlier on when he was getting kids to kick on their left and right and catch and throw, and without well-developed sport-specific skills, something to do with hurling and football, young people are going to be limited in their ability to participate at all. They're going to be limited in their ability to take part in sport. For young people, that might be even more of a factor because as they develop, sport gets more evaluative. Competition starts to play a really big role. And if I don't have the skills to take part competently, then I'm likely to stand out in front of my peers. I'm likely to not be as good as other people. And when that's coupled with an increase in self-consciousness as a teenager, it's probably unsurprising that Owen, like lots of other teenage kids who don't have fundamental skills, who don't have high levels of competence, choose not to take part in sport and avoid those situations where they might be exposed. But of course, actual competence, being able to do it is important. But what's also important is perceived competence. My confidence in my, be my ability to do it. And I think young people, like adults, we're going to avoid situations where, where we're not confident. We're going to avoid those situations where we might be showing up, where we don't believe we have the capacity to do something. And again, I think my challenge would be is how well in our youth coaching do we support high levels of confidence? How well do we support young people to develop the confidence that they need to stay involved in sport? I think more positively though, and it's a pretty technical term, what we really want children to, young people to have is give it a go-ness. Because even if I'm not very good, and maybe my confidence might be a bit waning, if I'm a young person that will persevere, will persist when I'm challenged, will give things a try, what we do know is that will underpin your engagement in sport. So again, how well do we support people in our, in our coaching environments to give things a go, to persist in the face of failure, to keep going when things get, get challenging? And also, we'll talk in a little bit about how learning is difficult. We all know, yeah, and again, Mick got people to do some tasks earlier on, and there was fumbles, and there was all sorts of things going on. So learning something is difficult. Taking part in sport is difficult. So we also want young people to have stick with itness. We want them to stay with the process, especially during the youth years when, God, they're faced with all sorts of different opportunities in their world outside sport. So stick with itness is another key characteristic that underpins engagement. But of course, there's more than sport happening in the lives of young people. And young people are faced with a range of bio, psycho, and social challenges. Biologically, maturation, 
puberty is going to play a huge role from 12, 13 upwards in how young people engage in sport. Um, psychologically, there's a lot happening in the teenage brain that's going to influence how they interact with these opportunities. And socially, peers, friendships, and other kind of relationships are going to influence your engage young people's engagement in sport. And I suppose the point here is that Owen, like lots of young players, wasn't inoculated against these challenges. He didn't have, it's a good 2022 word, he wasn't immune, he didn't have a vaccination, if you like, against these challenges of adolescence. He didn't have high enough competence, he didn't have the skills to participate, he didn't have high enough confidence in his ability to it, and he didn't have the ability to stick with the process. So I think probably most people in the room are coaching across a variety of different settings. You might be coaching in schools, you might be coaching in clubs, at academy level, at inter-county level. And to use the GA tagline, is there a place for everyone in our games? And I think what youth coaches, what we should really be doing is making sure that we give young people the skills to make sure that there is a place for them in our games. And this three worlds continuum is some work colleagues and I have done. And it suggests that there's three different worlds we can live in for t in terms of sport participation. The participation for personal well-being world. If I'm in there, I like going to the gym. I like going for a run. I like going for a walk. And I'm taking part in sport for kind of personal reasons, for health reasons. Some people in the room might live in a personal reference excellence world. I'm going to break an hour for a 10K. I'm going to get on to my junior B team. I'm going to run the Dublin Marathon in four hours, and that's excellent for me. Other people in the room might live in an elite excellence world. I want to get to nationals, I want to get on the county team, I want to win the championship. And that's their driving ambition. But the point here, I think, is that our motives for taking part in sport are going to vary across our lifespan. I'm sure some of us have started our lives in an elite world where we have great aspirations to play for our county or our country. And perhaps, certainly in my case, with uh, a lack of ability and now old age, I'm firmly over in a, in a personal reference excellence world and a health world. But the key here is as youth coaches, how do we make sure that young players can move between these worlds? So for example, if I'm a, an academy player this year and I don't make it onto a senior team, do we give them the experiences as a young player that they stay involved for other motives later on? Likewise, do we ensure that all young people get a meaningful experience in all of these three worlds? Good coaching, I think, and good coaches really do ensure that there's a place for everyone in our games. So what's the best way to coach young people? What are the best experiences that we can give young people to help them navigate between these different worlds? And I'm sure lots of people have heard some of these lines, just let them play or ditch those drills. And the idea here is that there's a growing advocacy or a growing kind of call to just allow young people play, just allow them engage in sport, just allow them experience our, our activities. And that's built on this assumption that just experience or playing will develop the skills that young people need to maintain their involvement in sport. And I'm certainly not going to say uh, that we shouldn't be allowing young people to just play. But I would suggest that just letting people play sport, just letting people participate, isn't going to give them the skills that they need to maintain their involvement. And in fact, just letting people participate might put too much of an emphasis on psychosocial outcomes, things like participation, enjoyment, and fun, and not enough of an emphasis on uh, the, the characteristics and skills, the competence and the confidence that young people need to engage in activities. In fact, there's loads of research that suggests that young people need to have instruction, coaching, and guidance to make the most of the, the, those experiences. And I think, after all, if they don't have that, why would we be coaches? Why would we be teachers? God, why would I even be a parent sometimes? So how do we provide the most appropriate activities and most appropriate um, experiences for young people? And I think the answer to nearly every question is going to be it depends. And there isn't one way to coach people. 
So when you're watching the demonstrations that have been happening here today, the clear purpose of those isn't that you go and replicate them on a Friday at your next training session. The emphasis is you start to consider why is he doing that and how would it work for me? So the best coaches are the ones with a really rich knowledge and understanding, not of what they're doing, but why they're doing it in the way that they're doing it. And I think there's a kind of couple of rules of learning that are probably interesting to, to consider. And especially when we're watching young people play, one of the key things to think about is a difference between performance and a difference between performance and learning. If I'm watching these kids over here practice, and I can see some kids doing some really great skills and they're kicking the ball really accurately, they're performing really well. They're doing that task, that drill, that activity really, really well. But I can't tell you that any learning is occurring. Likewise, there were some kids out the front earlier on just kicking the ball around, playing a kind of a 3v1 game, just messing with each other. They're engaged in that activity, they're participating in that activity, but again, I don't know if any learning is occurring. So what is learning? If I want my young players to learn, and that's what I said at the beginning, learning is long-term change in behavior. Long learning is long-term change in understanding. So one of the things I think is really important is as youth coaches, we have to make sure that coach our coaching is different to what adult coaching is, is like. And it should be personally relevant to the players that we're, we're working with. So these are a bunch of, I don't know, what are they, 12, 13-year-olds. We would coach those kids very different to how we would have coached the Mayo under 16s in the first session earlier on. And God, I'd certainly hope that we would coach them different than we would coach our adult session later on as well. So how often as a coach do you reference the aims, the interests, and the goals of your young players? How often as a coach of young people do you consider, okay, I'm doing this today so we can do this next week so those kids can do this next year? We have to think of their long-term plans. The other thing that I think is really important to promote learning in our young players is how often do we involve them? How often do we check their understanding about why, why they're doing what they're doing? And I think it's really important that we, we encourage our young players to become consumers of our coaching to not be afraid to ask, why am I doing this? Why are we doing this this way, and why, what other ways could we do it? So we really want to make sure that we provide learning experiences to young people that challenge their understanding, that get them to think about why they're doing what they're doing. And back to this idea about performance and learning. And I was having a conversation with Martin at lunchtime, and we were talking about the sessions that are going on. And some of the sessions have been a bit messy, and some of the sessions have been a bit chaotic, and there's loads of things happening, because that's the reality of all our coaching. It's certainly the reality of my coaching on a Saturday morning. Now, I might set up a coaching session that's really slick. Kids are passing the ball from A to B, and they look like they're performing really well. I might do that for lots of reasons. One of them might be because I want those kids to get really confident, and they get loads of success because it's easy and it's short term but I wouldn't want to do that all the time. So for long-term success, I want things to be a bit difficult. I want them to be challenging. And Bjork and Bjork talk about this idea of desirable challenges or desirable difficulties. When we're helping people learn, we want things to be hard, but in a good way. We want people to, be, to struggle a bit, to have to try really hard, to invest, to learn, to change their knowledge and change their understanding. I spend a lot of time going around lots of different sports working as a coach developer. And the first question that I ask when I go and watch a session or I go and work with a coach, and I go, okay, what was your purpose today? What's your intention of your coaching? What do you want out of this? And that helps me understand why they're doing what they're doing. Hopefully it helps the coaches understand why they're doing what they're doing. So how might, what sort of um, methods might you use when you're coaching? I think the key part here is that if you only have one way of coaching, if you only have one method of coaching, think of games or drills, then you're going to pull that tool out of your toolbox every single time. It's like the saying, if, everything, if all you have is a hammer, everything is going to look like a nail. If all I have is this one way of coaching, that's what I'm going to do all the time. 
But of course, the players, the context, and the environment I coach it is going to change. God, in my context, it probably changed minute by minute, certainly session by session. So what we want as coaches is to have a rich toolbox of skills, rich toolbox of methods. So sometimes I might coach like this, sometimes I might coach like this, and I have a really solid understanding about why I'm coaching the way I'm coaching. I have a plan, I have a, a deep intention there, and I have a plan so it meets the needs of the young people in front of me. I think one of the things that's really important when we're thinking about youth, co youth coaching is the role of competition. Yeah, and competition is a central part of sports. And, you know, certainly for me, and I'd hazard a guess for lots of people in the room, and certainly these kids over here, winning matters. Success matters. But as coaches, if it's a decision-making process, we have to think, how do we use competition in a developmentally appropriate way to drive learning? And if, comp if youth coaching is different to adult coaching, by God, we have to use youth competition in a different way to adult competition. And one of the a really robust finding in the literature is that underage, youth, underage success or youth success is a really poor predictor of long-term success. But what's really interesting is that underage success might actually be a pretty good predictor of dropout later on. So we have to be very careful with how we use that on the pathway. I'm sure some people in the room might have seen this slide before, and it's the Tony Forrestal is the All-Ireland Under-14 um, tournament. And on the slide, what you'll see on the left-hand side is the, un is the winners of the Tony Forrestal going back to 1982. And in the right-hand column, what you'll see is the winners of the All-Ireland four years later. So that age group that have moved up. The eagle-eyed in front of you will notice that there hasn't been one winner of the Tony Forrestal at under 14 level that has gone on and won the All-Ireland at, at four years later. For me, that's a really interesting youth coaching um, uh, demonstration. And it makes me think about a couple of things. I suppose, first of all, it makes me think, the coaches at under 14 level, were they making decisions about their coaching that prioritized success right now? Were they making decisions about selection, about tactics, about how they coached and the way they coached that resulted in short-term success, winning at under 14, but may have had repercussions later on in the pathway. Likewise, the coaches at minor level, were they making more developmentally appropriate decisions early on in the pathway that had reper positive repercussions at the tail end? Now, I'm not going to stand here and think I know the answer because I think there's loads of answers and loads of factors that might underpin it. But what I do know is from an evidence-informed perspective, the decisions that we make with young people and how we coach is certainly going to have long-term implications on their experience in sport. So therefore, we have to think about how we use things like competition developmentally appropriately. And I'm definitely not saying that competition is wrong. I, in my house, we'd have a competition about the flies crawling up a wall. We, it matters. Competition matters. But how, as coaches, do we use it appropriately and as a valuable tool to support learning? Like I said, winning matters. A couple of Christmases ago, Santa got a pretty detailed request from my six-year-old for a trophy. And all he wanted for Christmas was a trophy. And Julie, on Christmas morning, this trophy came into, into our house. And now, every Christmas morning, we play a multi-sport competition uh, of lots of different activities on the front uh, lawn of our house in Kilnard. And whatever adults and children are, are in our house, we play this competition. And whoever wins, wins the trophy for the year. And believe you me, winning that matters. There's been real tears when people lose, and there's been real joy when people win. And I think that's fine. I'm really, I'm fine with that. In fact, I guess lots of people here coach at Go Games. You coach a Go Games match, and all the kids come together at the end. What's the first question you're asked? Who won? What's the second question you're asked? What was the score? And that's fine, because winning is the essence of why we do sport. But for me, I think, let, let the kids worry about competition. Let the kids really care about competition. Let the kids worry about winning and losing. Let them be upset by winning and losing. But it's up to us as adults, as a decision-making process, to keep things in check, 
It's up to us as adults to use that competition in ways that are developmentally appropriate, in ways that increase those, those kids' learning, in ways that keeps them involved in the game. Just to finish, a couple of um, colleagues of mine have come up with this idea of how do we take all the stuff that we've talked about today, how would that help me become a better coach? And I was talking to someone in one of the breaks, and we were talking about what is the key part of becoming a good coach? And if back to that idea about being a chef and a cook, a chef has a really rich understanding about why they're doing what they're doing. And a chef really thinks about the alternatives about why they're doing what they're doing. And what, what we'll talk about now is just a series of questions, five questions that I ask myself at the end of every session or every match or every encounter with young people to answer the question, am I coaching in a manner that helps my kids, my players learn? Did my session help those children learn today? And the first kind of couple of questions in that really require me to go, what did I do today? What was my session about? What was my intention? And why did I do it the way I do it? And I think this idea of reflecting on our own experiences is critical to becoming a youth coach. This isn't something formal. This is me going home in the car. This is me thinking about this at bedtime. This is whatever. But I think about what did I do and why did I do it? I do that on my own. But actually, I'm really lucky that I'm in lots of clubs with lots of other coaches, and we do this together. We do it after a session. I go, what did you do today? What do you think worked? What would you have done differently? So one of my challenges would be, do you have a community of coaches? Do you have that in your club? Do you have someone that will come and watch your sessions and ask you questions about your coaching? Because if you really want to be a chef, you have to reflect back on that experience. The other questions, three and four, ask me then going, OK, I ran my session like that. What else could I have done? If I had organized it differently, if I'd used a different type of game, if I'd given different type of feedback, what would the result have been? Would those players have had a better experience? Would they have learned more? Would it have been more, a more optimal learning experience? And then in the last step, what I do is go, OK, how am I going to get better? How am I going to take this reflection, understanding why I did what I did, and become a better coach the next time? Back to our idea of Thurus. I'm on this journey. I reflect on what I did, plan for the future, and move on again. So we want better coaches make better players. I really believe that youth coaching is different to adult coaching. I think the methods that we use, the approaches that we use, and the interactions that we have are different to adult coaching. And therefore, we have to coach in a different way when we're coaching young players. How and why you coach is key. Lots of coaches come on coaching courses, and they want to leave with a, with a bag of drills. What can I do next Tuesday night or Saturday morning? And I, I want that. But I want to know more about why I would use them in certain ways. Never before has there been as much information about coaching available. Hands up if you were at a webinar over COVID. Everyone has been at a webinar over COVID. People are on Twitter. People are go to coach education. There is loads of information out there. My challenge is to be a critical consumer of that. Don't take what I say at face value. Don't say, take what Liam says at face value. Ask questions. Ask, why would that work in my context? Why wouldn't it work in my context? And really be critical about what you hear. If there really is going to be a place for everyone in our games, then our cru crucial job as youth coaches is to set that foundation to make sure young players have the competence and confidence to navigate between those worlds that we talked around a second ago. Just to finish, I'd like to tell a little story. A couple of years ago, there was an article in the Limerick Leader. And in this article, it was actually a letter to the Limerick Leader from a 14-year-old boy. And like lots of 14-year-old boys in Limerick, he loved hurling. He knew he wasn't the best. He knew he was probably never going to get on a county team. But he never missed a training session. He tried hard, and he gave it his all. But he rarely got picked. He rarely got on a pitch. He rarely got to play. And in this letter, he describes how he felt his coaches and his teachers had a win-at-all-costs attitude. 
that they were just interested in the outcome of these competitions. And his, his team got to a final. And this kid describes in the letter how he was really hoping to get on that pitch. Even if it was just as a sub, it meant so much to him to get on the pitch. The day of the final came, the coaches picked younger, presumably better players, and he didn't even get on the pitch. In the letter, he describes how cross he was, how upset he was. But most upsettingly in the letter, he describes how he never went and played hurling again. That was the last day he was involved in that club. And I suppose this really makes me think back to the three worlds earlier on. This coaching decision might have led to some short-term success. They may well have gone and won that match. They may well have gone and some of those players might have gone on to play for, for, better, for Limerick teams or whatever. But how many young players do we lose by some of these decisions on the pathway? How many young players like this kid, because of that decision, never played that sport again? And I think for me, the important aspect here is doing the wrong thing developmentally might give you some short-term success, might win you a trophy, might develop one or two players to become really you know, county stars. But doing the wrong thing developmentally, or sorry, doing the right thing developmentally is much more likely to have re positive repercussions for all the players. It's much more likely to give them a place to be and retain in our games. And I think pretty solid advice as youth coaches is we wouldn't want to be anybody's last coach. We wouldn't want someone to give up sport because of the experience that they had in our, in our team. Thank you very much.